Good evening, Tributes. I hope you are all well. So, just before we begin, some of you might notice that there are only three games in this video, and this is how it will be from now on. This is because I've managed to get a new job in translation, which so far is going pretty well, but due to this I don't have as much time to make these videos. Now, seeing as I want to keep the videos up at the same quality and don't want to rush them out too quickly, I'm keeping to three videos a week. I hope you understand, but also if you want to know a bit more and see some details of the games earlier, please follow me on Twitter or Reddit, and the links are in the description. So, without further ado, here we go. The 61st games took place in a humid jungle. They featured vicious flamingos, a thunderstorm, and lasted for 13 days. Due to the excitement that was caused during last year's Sonic Surge, the Feast was introduced this year, in order to not just bring tributes back together and cause a second wave of deaths, but to also shake up the games and potentially level the playing field, which could often lead to an epic showdown. This year's victor was Justin Hicks, age 16, from District 6. Before he had even left his district, Justin seemed defeated, like he had already resigned himself to a mortal fate within the games. During training, he and his district partner, Massachusetts, a depraved morphling addict, spent most of their time experimenting with the various paints and trying to camouflage themselves into the floor and walls of the training centre. Justin therefore failed to make much of an impression on the game makers or his fellow tributes, except for one. One day during training, Clearfell from Nine was leaning against a wall, without knowing that Justin had camouflaged himself right next to where he was standing. When Justin suddenly sneezed, Clearfell jumped from the shock, which made Justin laugh and finally show some emotion for the first time since he had been reaped. Realising that he might have just made a bad first impression, Justin immediately apologised, but after Clearfell realised that nobody else had witnessed his surprise, he grinned at what had just happened and the pair introduced themselves properly. Clearfell was rather interested in Justin's ability to camouflage, which he realised could be extremely useful in various situations within the arena. He therefore asked Justin to show him how to do some basic camouflage and in return, Clearfell showed Justin how to use a pitchfork most effectively, thanks to his experience of living on one of District 9's largest farms. The pair struck up a strong rapport during the training, which helped them demonstrate and improve their skills even further. There were even some occasions when the training staff had to stop them from talking to each other when it was time for individual training. When the gong sounded, Justin ran as quickly as he could and grabbed a sandwich. He then considered running for a weapon, but just at that moment, Massachusetts was shot in the head by an arrow right in front of him, which scared him enough to flee from the cornucopia clearing and into the jungle. Justin continued travelling away from the cornucopia for the rest of the first day. Like many other tributes, he quickly noticed how hot the arena was, and he removed his jacket. However, unfortunately for him, the mud and other materials in the arena were not wet or viscous enough to be effectively used for camouflage. As night fell, Justin climbed a tree and decided to sleep there, albeit without being camouflaged, which would make him very vulnerable to an attack. However, in the morning, Justin was very pleased to see that it had rained during the night, which allowed him to camouflage himself to some degree. He also used the wet mud to stick the bark from the tree over his clothes, which allowed him to blend in easier with the trees. However, when there were still 13 tributes left on the evening of the third day, Justin suddenly heard panicked screams rapidly approaching him. At that moment, he was reapplying some more mud to his neck, but the screaming was approaching him so quickly that he did not want to risk giving away his position by climbing the tree. He therefore threw himself onto the ground next to the tree, and very shortly after, Root from 11 and Delia from 12 unknowingly ran straight past him. As soon as they had run past, Justin heard some intense clucking immediately follow them. However, during this time, he did not dare to open his eyes or turn his head, as this may give away his position to other tributes or even these creatures that he could not yet see. However, after just a mere moment had passed, Justin heard loud, shrill screaming and the clucking intensify from nearby. At this point, his curiosity got the better of him and he carefully raised his head and watched from behind the tree. To Justin's horror, Root and Delia were being savagely pecked by a flamboyance of vicious flamingos. The birds continued pecking at them incessantly, with their screams echoing out through the jungle, before the screaming eventually stopped and their cannons sounded. Justin appeared to be in some sort of mortified shock at what he was witnessing. He automatically took a step back, but when a stick cracked under his foot, the flamingos all immediately ceased pecking at Root and Delia's corpses and then turned around, glaring intensely. They started prancing towards him, but in a panicked rush, he scurried up a nearby tree, whilst the flamingos hopped about impatiently beneath. Justin was indeed very lucky that these flamingos could not fly. Over the next few days, the number of tributes descended to ten, and Justin was forced to stay in this tree for the next two days, 
whilst the flamingo stubbornly refused to move, and hence stopped him from being able to get down from the tree. However, by the fifth day, Justin was starving, and it was becoming more and more difficult for him to drink from the rainwater. That night, whilst the flamingos appeared to be sleeping, he realised that now might be his only chance to escape from them before he ended up starving to death. Justin climbed down the tree so slowly and carefully that it took him eight minutes in total to reach the ground. As he lowered himself down the tree, the flamingos would sometimes stir in their slumber and ruffle their feathers or eyelids whilst they slept. As this was happening, it was extremely tense and in fact the quietest that Capitol residents in Viewing Square had ever been. Justin finally made it to the ground and through the darkness he had to be very careful where he was treading as he slowly made his way through the flock of sleeping flamingos. When one flamingo dozily flapped its wings and hit Justin on the leg, he had to literally bite his tongue in order to not make a sound. Eventually, he had crept far enough from the flamingos to be able to start running, which did awaken the flamingos, but he had already travelled far enough from them and was able to escape. The bravery and stealth shown by Justin that night finally put him on the capital's radar, and he was gifted by sponsors with not just a bottle of water, but also a selection of camouflage makeup colours that sponsors knew he would want. The next day, Justin awoke up a tree in another area of the arena that he had travelled to the previous night in an effort to avoid the flamingos. He spent his first moments that day observing the surrounding area in the daylight whilst checking for any sign of a flamingo. He cautiously descended from the tree and then applied some of the camouflage to his skin in order to match the colour tones of the nearby jungle. He also noticed a relatively small lake just behind some bushes that were next to his tree. However, as Justin finished his camouflage, he heard someone running in his direction. In a panic, Justin quickly burrowed himself within the bushes by the small lake and waited as he heard the running getting closer. Suddenly, Clearfell appeared from behind a nearby tree and Justin immediately decided to at least try and help him hide from whatever was chasing him. As Clearfell approached the bushes, he slowed down, seemingly deciding which way he should go, whilst Justin heard the careers now jeering as they were approaching from not too far away. Justin suddenly jumped out of the bushes to alert Clearfell to his presence, which once again made him jump. However, this time there was no laughter, but instead Justin grabbed Clearfell's arm and quickly pulled him the few steps to the lake, whilst he was still in a state of shock and surprise. Justin quickly told Clearfell to take a deep breath before pushing Clearfell and then throwing himself into the lake. Viewers saw that within seconds of the pair going beneath the surface of the lake's water, the careers ran through the clearing and carried on past the lake, in an unstoppable pursuit of Clearfell. Justin was able to see through the lake's water and saw the careers running past above the surface, whilst he held Clearfell, who was now running out of breath beneath the surface. After almost a minute had passed, Justin let go and both he and Clearfell rose to the surface and gasped out for oxygen as quietly as they could in this setting. While still in the lake, Justin quickly explained to Clearfell about what had happened and that they needed to move on, but as Justin swam past Clearfell in order to go back to the lake's edge, Clearfell grabbed him by the arm, looked him in the eye, and sincerely thanked him for saving his life. Justin smiled and said that Clearfell was welcome, but that they needed to move quickly. The pair then ran back in the opposite direction to the career pack, but just as they slowed down, Justin started to hear the demented clucking of the flamingos from the path just in front of them. He quickly stopped himself and Clearfell from running any further, but just as the clucking temporarily quietened down for a second, they once again heard the arrogant taunts of the careers getting nearer from the direction that they had just come. Justin told Clearfell that they needed to climb a tree again, but Clearfell was not so skilled with doing this, and was unable to climb that high, especially when he was in such a frenzy. Justin therefore helped him up to a branch that was just out of reach of the flamingos, then they pranced into the clearing and flapped excitedly as they advanced towards Justin. He quickly climbed the tree and just about managed to avoid being nipped by the flamingos as the excited careers entered the clearing. However, as they were aiming their weapons at Clearfell and Justin, the flamingos ran straight towards them. They managed to shoot down a few of the flamingos, but were ultimately sent fleeing back the way they had come. The flamingos caught up with all four of the careers and savagely pecked each of them to death, except for Jezebel from two, who despite receiving some injuries, managed to survive and escape. Justin and Clearfell spent the night keeping watch and sleeping, which allowed them both to catch up on sleep. It also rained in the morning, which gave them access to drinking water, Furthermore, Clearfell was gifted with some fruit from sponsors, which he chose to share with Justin. As the day went by, the pair relaxed and spoke to each other about their districts and backgrounds. Justin told Clearfell that his parents had died from morphling overuse when he was young, and that he had been raised by his elder sister, 
whilst he had never had a real relationship. Clearfell revealed that he was recently single after his long-term relationship had ended. It was thought by many Capital viewers to be an unusual scene to witness during the Hunger Games, with assistant commentator Caesar Flickerman stating that the boys were acting more like they were on a romantic date. That afternoon, a violent thunderstorm poured over the arena and Justin was gifted with a blanket by sponsors, which he chose to share with Clearfell. The pair huddled together under a larger tree and managed to save themselves from the worst part of the storm. However, the storm forced some other tributes to move around, which caused Lupe and Alvaro, both from 10, to walk straight into a trap set by Jezebel, whilst Dwayne, from 11, was slain by a rowdy flamboyance of flamingos. Once the storm ended, there were six tributes remaining. Justin said that he needed to camouflage himself again, in case of an attack from other tributes or more flamingos. He agreed to apply some more camouflage to Clearfell as well, even to the areas that he found hard to reach, such as his upper back. Many Capital viewers pointed out that this scene was strangely erotic and the pair were subsequently gifted with some more bread, which they ate for the rest of the day whilst hiding in the mud by the nearest tree. Two more days went by, and there were still five tributes left. Just as Justin and Clearfell were discussing where their remaining opponents could be, the game makers made an announcement that a feast would shortly be held in the cornucopia clearing, and that each of the remaining tributes would be gifted with an item that they would desperately need. Justin immediately considered this to be a dangerous idea, whereas Clearfell seemed excited by the prospect and hoped for a pitchfork. The pair argued about whether or not they should go, but eventually Justin convinced Clearfell not to go. However, a short while later, when Justin was relieving himself in nearby bushes, he came back to find that Clearfell was nowhere to be seen. Realising that Clearfell had gone to the feast without him, Justin panicked and called out for him, until he remembered that he did not want to attract unwanted attention. He nervously paced back and forwards across the path, worried that Clearfell might die during this feast, or even abandon him completely. A few minutes later, Justin heard a cannon boom out, and not knowing whose death it was that had just occurred, he found his breathing spiralling out of control, and his legs gave way into a panicked frenzy. Just as it started to rain again, and Justin stared into the rain puddles forming, a voice from nearby him said, I've got something for you before he looked up to see Clearfell holding a bag for himself and a bag for Justin. Without even thanking Clearfell, Justin lunged forward at him, shouting that he had told him not to go and then hitting him with anger. However, viewers could also see that he possessed a hidden joy that Clearfell had safely returned. Whilst Clearfell grabbed Justin's arms in order to stop him from being hit any more, Justin got an arm free and grabbed Clearfell's t-shirt, then pulled him close and kissed him. Justin pulled himself away a few seconds later and they looked at each other, with equal levels of surprise and intent, before Clearfell grabbed Justin by the neck and kissed him for a longer time, and with an undeniable passion. They held and kissed each other for longer, seemingly forgetting where they were, before they carelessly ripped off each other's clothes whilst the rain continued to pour over their unclothed bodies, lashing harder as the pair became more intimate with each other. In fact, whilst Clearfell was running his tongue further and further down Justin's spine, the ensuing gasps of pleasure grew louder and louder, until they were heard by a nearby flamboyance of flamingos. It was even revealed several years later by the head game maker Harley Breen that they chose to veer these flamingos away from Clearfell and Justin, so that they would not interrupt their intimacy. This went on to be one of the most talked about moments of this year's games, especially seeing as it was the first scene of same-sex intimacy within the history of the Hunger Games. Once they had finished being intimate, the sunlight returned and the pair spent the remainder of the day resting in each other's arms and joking about what their friends and families would have thought of each other. As the darkness rolled in, they looked up through some of the overhanging trees at the night sky, and Clearfell spoke about how he and his friends would often look up at the stars from the middle of the fields, where there was no light that could outshine the stars. Justin said that no matter what happened in the arena or even afterwards, he would remember this night with Clearfell for the rest of his life. Clearfell reached over and kissed him, and they fell asleep shortly afterwards. However, the next morning, Justin realised that there were now just two other tributes remaining apart from himself and Clearfell. As he looked at Clearfell peacefully sleeping, he realised that he was falling for him, and that he did not want the final showdown to be between them. Therefore, he quietly got up and grabbed some bread and his remaining clothes. He also took his feast bag, which he had not yet opened, but he subsequently found to contain a small dagger. He then walked quietly away through the jungle until he was out of sight, before jogging back to the cornucopia. 
it was clear to viewers that he was trying to hold back tears as he travelled further and further away from Clearfell. Over the next two days, Justin camouflaged himself with the bark of a tree and slept in this same tree, which was close to the cornucopia. He rationed his remaining bread and stayed very careful to not alert the attention of the flamingos, who would occasionally prance by. On the night of the twelfth day, he heard a cannon boom out and spent the rest of the day once again trying not to worry that this was Clearfell who had just died. However, when the fallen tributes were shown that night, he felt guilty to be relieved that it was in fact Margarita from Four who had died. The next day, Justin awoke to the sound of lightning in the distance, and when he sat up in the tree, he saw that it was coming from around the edge of the perimeter. Remembering that he was one of three tributes left, he realised that it was now time for the showdown, and so he quickly got down from the tree whilst readying his dagger for potential action. As he ran back to the cornucopia, he heard another cannon sound, but made himself continue without looking back. However, it was revealed to viewers that this was Jezebel who had died, when a tree was struck by lightning and fell straight onto her as she ran. As Justin was about to run into the cornucopia, he was ironically heartbroken to see that his own near-living opponent was Clearfell. As Justin walked into the cornucopia clearing, Clearfell turned around to see him. He told Justin that he had guessed why he had left at the time, and without even knowing for sure what Clearfell had guessed exactly, Justin sorrowfully nodded his head. Clearfell then took out a small dagger and apologised to Justin before he charged towards him. The pair both fought bravely, but in a somewhat melancholy manner, and Clearfell managed to stab Justin in the arm. However, when Justin stabbed Clearfell in the stomach, it appeared to be much more painful, and Clearfell almost fell over. Whilst he was losing his balance, Justin stabbed him again in the stomach, which sent him falling to the floor. As Clearfell's breathing slowed and he started losing consciousness, Justin knelt by his side and tears formed in his eyes as he sorrowfully apologised to Clearfell. Justin then told him that he would never forget him, and a tear flowed down Clearfell's cheek before he turned to Justin and smiled. His cannon then sounded, which left Justin as this year's victor. After winning these games, Justin was racked with guilt after having killed his friend and lover. Despite being from District 6, he had hardly ever used Morphling before these games, but in the time before the victor's interview, he quickly latched onto this drug, which made for a rather disastrous interview. In fact, many people think this is the real reason why Festus Creed retired as the head interviewer shortly after these games had concluded. Justin later returned to District 6, and spent most of the next years in the Morphling dens of the District Centre. He was later killed in the 75th Hunger Games. The 60-second games took place in an abandoned factory complex. They featured rabid dogs, a countdown explosion, and lasted for eight days. This year's victor was remembered for her main method of killing changing halfway throughout the games from something traditional to something iconic. This year's victor was Inabaria Golding, aged 17, from District 2. Just like the past two years, there were many volunteers from District 2, with Inabaria being one of 14 young ladies who volunteered for the position of female tribute. Therefore, as usual in this district, the potential tributes were placed into the district's local arenas, where they would each have three bracelets attached to them, one around each wrist, along with another around their neck. Once all three of these bracelets had been broken off, this tribute would be eliminated and then be airlifted out of the arena. However, the last tribute to still have at least one of these bracelets attached to them would receive the honour of representing District 2 in the games. This year, Mayor Plinth decided to place potential female tributes into the mountain arena on the outskirts of the district, whereas their 19 male counterparts were placed into the more distant arena of the city and Salt Lake. Inabaria ripped off a total of 14 bracelets throughout this game, mainly through working with her friend Bianca and attacking individual tributes before she eventually turned on Bianca and went on to win. Meanwhile, Thaddeus Cap won the boys' game, which earned them both the honour of being this year's tributes for District 2. During training, Inabaria and Thaddeus made an alliance with Marble and Diamanda, both from one, but still watched them very carefully when they practised with weapons, while sharing with each other what this other pair's strengths and weaknesses were. However, Inabaria and Thaddeus correctly suspected that Marble and Diamanda were having exactly the same conversations about them. As the countdown rocked down towards the gong, Inabaria was one of many tributes who was surprised to see that the arena was indoors, and she quickly thought about how this would affect this year's games. She looked around the very large room that encompassed the cornucopia, 
and noticed that the main exits from this room seemed to lead into other rooms of this building, which appeared to be an old factory. During the victor's interview, Inabaria admitted that this annoyed her, as she had practiced in many different kinds of arenas during her time at the training academy, but she had never fought in a place like this and was unsure of what dangers she might encounter. So when the gong sounded, Inabaria quickly sprinted to the weapon stash before grabbing a set of throwing knives. To her horror, she felt an arm gripping around her neck as she was looking for her prearranged targets. She automatically stabbed this arm with the knife and then jolted round to stab the owner of this arm, Turbo, from five, through the eye, which led to his death shortly after. She then saw her targets, Carlotta from 4 and Helena from 10, both running for supplies on her left. So she neared them and threw knives at the pair, hitting Carlotta through the heart and Helena through the neck, which killed them both shortly afterwards. Inabaria looked to her right and saw Thaddeus being strangled by Tamarix from 7, who was crouched on top of him. She then ran straight towards the pair before kicking Tamarix in the groin and thereby releasing his grip on Thaddeus's neck before he collapsed back down to the ground and Inabaria stabbed him with a knife. As she helped Thaddeus to his feet, they surveyed the damage and discussed with Dimander and Marble about who had killed whom, along with which tributes may have taken which supplies and which direction they saw the surviving tributes going. Then, as previously agreed, the careers each took supplies from whichever tributes they had killed. None of them claimed the body of Florida from Six, but there was nothing useful on his body anyway. As a death claw came down from the roof to collect the bodies, Inabaria and the rest of the careers realised that it was time for them to move on from the cornucopia, and so they roamed the arena for the rest of that first day. Unfortunately for them, they weren't able to find any more tributes, and so they spent that night sleeping in what appeared to be an old staff room within this factory. The next morning, the careers continued to travel through the arena, and whilst they were resting in one of the smaller factory rooms, Bessie, from 12, walked into this room. Once she saw the careers sat there, she immediately ran, but it was too late as the careers were already on their feet. Marble was the one who managed to tackle her, just metres from where they had seen her. He was about to stab Betty, but Diamanda then asked him if she could kill her, as it had always been one of her ambitions to kill a twelve. Marble lowered his knife and playfully said, go on then, before Diamanda got on top of Betty and continually stabbed her chest whilst humming a merry tune to herself. Even Nina Barrier and Thaddeus appeared to find this slightly sadistic, but within minutes Diamanda was gifted with a bottle of perfume, which she applied generously to her neck. This was the first time that such a cosmetic sponsor gift had been given within the arena, but Ina Baria later admitted that she was slightly jealous of Daimanda for receiving it. However, when they were walking through another room later that day, it was Ina Baria who spotted Solara from five out of the corner of her eye, conspicuously watching them through a broken window in the room next to them. Ina Baria told the other careers to keep looking at her whilst she was talking, and that they were in fact being watched. As they continued looking at her, she picked up her bow and arrow and pretended to clean them, but then suddenly turned and fired the arrow at Solara, who did manage to duck in time, but it still hit her in the shoulder. As Solara screamed out, Inabaria and the other careers headed to this window, and without even stopping, Inabaria was the first to push out the broken glass and hoist herself into this adjacent room, where Solara was now limping away whilst trying to take the arrow out of her shoulder. The other careers told Inabaria to wait for them, but she did not want to waste any time and quickly caught up with Solara before jumping onto her and holding her down on the ground. Solara begged for mercy, but Inabaria ignored her, whilst the other careers made it through the broken window and then surrounded the pair. Inabaria considered how she could commit an entertaining death, and she later admitted that she did what happened next without really giving it much thought. Whilst Inabaria was looking pensively into Solara's widened eyes, she lunged down and bit into Solara's neck. Solara screamed out in pain, and after readjusting her mouth's position, Inabaria ripped out some skin and flesh, before spitting it out at Dimander's feet, which made her squeal in disgust and then run away to vomit. Inabaria saw that Solara was struggling to breathe, and so she quickly bit her again, in order to put her out of her misery. A cannon then sounded, and Inabaria got up, before wiping her mouth on her jacket, as Thaddeus and Marble looked on with a mixture of shock and admiration. Just as Diamanda recovered and returned to the rest of the careers, a sponsor gift flew in for Inabaria, which she was delighted to find was body armour. The camera showed her pleasure at receiving the armour, but then panned over to Diamanda, who was now clearly seething with jealousy. Inabaria immediately put on this armour, and the next two days rolled by, with the careers travelling to one end of the arena before they chose to make their way to the opposite end, 
whilst taking it in turns to kill wayward tributes that they encountered along their way. There were eleven tributes remaining by the fifth day, when the careers ventured into another large room, and they started hearing a high-pitched whistle coming from a spot on one of the walls. However, as the four of them went over to examine the noise, Inabaria appeared to be suspicious and considered that this might be a trap. Just as she mouthed at Thaddeus to be careful, she saw a pack of dogs rapidly approaching from the opposite side of the room. Whilst Amanda had her ear to the wall and was trying to understand what was causing the noise, Inabaria threw a knife straight at her foot, which made her collapse to the ground in pain. Marble looked around at Inabaria in a state of disbelief, but just as he noticed the dogs approaching, Thaddeus snuck up behind him and snapped his neck which killed him instantly. Dimanda screamed as the dogs attacked her, whilst one of them came after Inabaria and Thaddeus, who ran away. As this dog jumped towards Thaddeus, he held out a knife, which impaled it, before the pair continued running away. However, as they ran out of the room, they looked up and saw Fax and Luma, both from three, who had somehow managed to climb up on top of the metal bars attached to the ceiling, whilst they observed the ongoing carnage below them. At this point, though, they saw that Inabaria and Thaddeus had seen them. As Inabaria and Thaddeus took cover from the dogs in the adjacent room, Thaddeus told Inabaria that Fax and Luma must have set a whistle frequency that could attract these dogs, which they must have turned on when they saw their group entering the room. Inabaria then told Thaddeus that they would need to kill these two whilst they had the chance. They quietly conferred before they simultaneously attacked these tributes. Inabaria shot an arrow at Fax's neck, which killed him almost instantly, whilst Thaddeus threw a spear at one of the lights, which made such a loud noise that it made Luma jump, and she subsequently fell from this metal bar all the way down to the floor. Although the dogs had initially run towards Inabaria and Thaddeus as soon as they appeared in the doorway, their attention was quickly turned to Luma, who was now unable to move after falling from such a great height. Inabaria and Thaddeus then used the distraction to run away, and spent the next day travelling as far as they could from these dogs. Two more days went by, and there were now just seven tributes left. During the morning of the seventh day, Inabaria and Thaddeus awoke after spending the night on top of some broken and empty vending machines. The game makers then announced that a feast would shortly take place within the cornucopia, with each of the tributes having access to something that they needed. Inabaria was wondering what the game makers might think she needed, but Thaddeus expected to get armour like Inabaria had, seeing as the only gift he had been given so far was some water. Therefore the pair made their way back to the cornucopia clearing, and lay in wait outside a nearby doorway, whilst observing the five different feast bags and waiting to pounce. Just as the pair quietly discussed when they should approach their bag, Ivy, from Seven, quickly ran out into the clearing and grabbed her bag. However, as she ran away, she was tackled by Antoine, from Eleven, before Delphine, from Eleven, ran over to stab her with a knife whilst Antoine held her down. Just as Lilica, from Eight, was grabbing her feast bag, Inabaria and Thaddeus ran towards the table. Inabaria ran around the ongoing brawl and shot Jen from Nine in the chest with an arrow before grabbing the feast bag for District 2. Meanwhile, Thaddeus was stabbing Delphine with his spear, but was not quick enough to attack Antoine, who threw his knife straight at Thaddeus's heart, which killed him instantly. Antoine eyed Inabaria and looked ready to throw his knife, so she quickly ran through the nearest door and kept moving from the cornucopia. Whilst Inabaria was running, she checked the inside of her feast bag and was dismayed to see that there was some armour for Thaddeus, but only a small bottle of poison for herself. She was unsure as to whether she would find a useful opportunity to use it, but stashed it in her bag as she carried on running. That evening, a cannon sounded whilst Dinabaria was eating, and as she looked at one of the screens that night when the national anthem sounded, she saw that it was Lilica, who was later revealed to have succumbed to symptoms of rabies after being in contact with the dogs. The next morning, Inabaria awoke to a large explosion coming from the next room. She was immediately suspicious, but then realised that with just three tributes left, the showdown was now in sight. She therefore started running whilst explosions rocked along behind her, and made bricks fly out of the walls and metal bars crash down from the ceiling, which would often fire very close to Inabaria, and very nearly killed her on multiple occasions. At one point, she was almost out of breath but realised that she had to keep running, and later shared that she wished she had not run so far away from the cornucopia the day before. Eventually, Inabaria made it back to the cornucopia, but as she ran into this room, she was immediately smacked in the face with a metal stick by Antoine, who had been waiting for her by this entrance. She fell to the floor and was very nearly stabbed in the heart by Antoine, but she rolled out of the way in time, and instead was only stabbed in the side of her stomach. She then punched Antoine in the face, 
and as he fell backwards, she shot him with an arrow in the stomach as he clutched his nose. He tried to get back up, and she was about to shoot another arrow, but then remembered what had seemed to go down well with the capital's audience. She therefore pounced on top of Antoine, and savagely yet slowly bit into his throat, before spitting his flesh at the nearest camera. After a few minutes, he eventually died, and Inabaria became this year's victor. After winning the games, Inabaria spent time living in the capital. Within months, she decided to get her teeth sharpened as a way of paying homage to her method of becoming a victor, and she subsequently took over Septimus Paddock's role as head of training between 63 and 71. Inabaria fought in the 75th Hunger Games, but was luckily rescued by the capital when the games were interrupted by rebel forces. However, after the Second Rebellion, she returned to District 2, and later became the head game maker for the unofficial games dubbed the Capital Games, which took place in 78. Later in 88, after the reclamation had occurred, she fought in the 76th Hunger Games, and came in fifth out of the 30 tributes who fought that year. The 63rd Games took place in a long grass arena. It featured irritating grasshoppers, an immunity pill rush, and lasted for 11 days. Whilst this year's arena did not appear to be particularly deadly at first, a later twist during the feast revealed the true nature of the hidden danger that had been lurking within the arena all along. This year's victor was Gloss Richlund, aged 18, from District 1. Following the surge in career volunteers that started in the early 60s, Districts 1 and 2 invented different methods in which they would determine which of their volunteers would earn the honour of fighting for their district. Whilst District 2's volunteers would fight non-lethal battles in their training academy's own arenas, District 1 opted for a democratic approach, with citizens of the district voting for which of their volunteers would be allowed to fight on behalf of their district. As Gloss was at the maximum age of 18 and of a more athletic build, he quite easily made it through the first round of voting, and into the final five males out of the twenty that had volunteered. During the talent demonstration on the night of the final vote, he demonstrated remarkable skills with the dagger, and in the Q&A section, he used his stoic charm and good looks to his advantage, while showing a strong knowledge of winning strategies from previous games, which ultimately won him the place of tribute for District 1 for this year. Meanwhile, the female tribute this year was Larima Katri. After scraping through the first round of voting, she conducted an impressive display with a set of throwing knives during the talent demonstration. During the Q&A section, she was slightly quieter than the other finalists, however she held her nerve and did not get involved in the petty shouting match that occurred between three of her opponents. The next day it came as a slight surprise when it emerged that Larima had won, with rumours quickly spreading throughout the district that she had recently been caught leaving Mayor Braun's manor one morning. However, this was never proven to be true, and the decision had already been made and signed by Mayor Braun, which meant that Gloss and Larima left their district for the capital later that week in order to prepare for the games. For training, Gloss and Larima were introduced to Albus and Junior, both from two, and the group immediately struck up a strong rapport with each other. They trained effectively together, and took it in turns to watch other tributes train, whilst clearly communicating to each other what they had observed to be the strengths and weaknesses of their opponents. As a group, they concluded that their only real opponents were Ashin from 7, Sefi from 9, and Dimitri from 10. However, after being observed by his mentor, Flash, during training, Gloss was occasionally reminded that Albus and Junior, and even Larima, were all his enemies and that being from District 2, the former pair would likely snap his neck without hesitation if given the opportunity. Gloss therefore decided from that point to only socialise with his fellow careers when he needed to. Following Flash's advice, he later admitted that he would also make himself imagine killing his fellow careers, so that it would not be so difficult to do so when the need arose. When the games began and the podiums were raised to the ground surface, Gloss tried to look around to examine the arena, but found himself exchanging agitated looks with the other careers, due to them not being able to see anything beyond the extremely tall grass which surrounded this cornucopia clearing. However, he noticed that he was stood directly next to Ashen from Seven, so he raised his right little finger, to show that he would take him as his target. As the gong sounded, Gloss immediately ran for Ashin and tackled him, before bashing his head into the ground and then snapping his neck, thereby earning himself the achievement of the first kill of the games. He then grabbed a sword which he used to kill Lacey from 8 and subsequently Cuth from 5, before convening with the careers once any survivors had escaped the clearing. They were pleased to see that between them they had managed to kill 9 other tributes. 
Over the rest of the first day, Gloss and the rest of the career pack continued travelling through the arena and looking for other tributes. As a group, they took it in turns to lead, which meant that this person would have to chop their way through the grass in order to form a path to walk through. However, due to the constant stamina this chopping work would require, the group often found themselves taking breaks in order to rest, especially due to the sun's sweltering rays that exhausted them throughout the day. As the careers rested, they noticed that grasshoppers would sometimes appear and rest near them, whilst chirping quietly. Upon killing one and then conducting a closer inspection, Junior asserted that they were not dangerous, and that none of the group would need to defend themselves from these grasshoppers. As the sun set, they set a camp in the middle of a grassy mound, whilst taking it in turns that night to sleep and look out. When the careers awakened the next day, they continued to explore through the arena before reaching the perimeter at midday. They were disappointed to have not found any other tributes since the blood buff, but as they rested by the perimeter, Gloss was reminded of a previous games that he had used as a case study whilst at the training academy. In an arena that was similar to this, the victor had managed to lift up one of his allies in order to see other tributes forming paths as they travelled through the cornfields, which had greatly helped him to win. Therefore, as they started moving and decided to travel to the cornucopia, Gloss told Larima to get on his shoulders. At first, she seemed to think that she had misheard him, but when Gloss explained, she was happy to oblige, and she then got up on Gloss's shoulders, which allowed her to look out over the rest of the arena. Albus then carried Junior on his shoulders, which allowed her as well to have a better view. Whilst the girls reported that they could see some paths that had already been formed through the grass, they were unable to see any new paths being formed at that moment. However, as the four of them travelled further, with Junior looking to the left and Larima looking to the right, Larima spotted movement not far away in front of them. The group continued travelling to the spot, and when they were close enough, Larima and Gloss walked slowly through the grass until they reached the trampled grass that formed the path that they had seen. The pair then saw Junior Pera from Eleven, trying to light a fire within this clearing, and they quickly snuck up on her. As Junipera heard them and jolted around in terror, she let out a shrill scream and tried to run before Larima stabbed her through the heart, killing her immediately. The group then continued roaming through the arena for the rest of the day, and they successfully killed two more tributes by spotting grass moving. Shortly after the careers awoke the next day, they argued over which direction they should go, and they calculated that there were 11 tributes remaining, including themselves. However, whilst they were getting ready to set out for the day, the game makers made an announcement that a virus, which caused temporary paralysis, will be leaked into the arena in five minutes, and that the only way to be immune to this virus would be to consume one of the pills that would now be released within the cornucopia. However, they were also warned that they could only take one pill each, and if any tribute held more than one at any time, then their tracker would detonate. As Gloss and the other careers quickly packed their supplies and got ready to leave, Jinia led their attention to a clock on the highest roof in the arena, which was now counting down from five minutes. The four careers then sprinted back to the cornucopia clearing and arrived just as there were two minutes remaining on the timer in the sky. As they arrived at the clearing and looked through the grass, they saw Anastasia from 10 grabbing a pill and then running, whilst Loam from 11 was viciously stabbing Jay from 4. Whilst watching this gory scene, Junior and Albus said that they would grab their pills first, whilst Gloss and Larima would cover them. Then they would swap roles and cover Gloss and Larima whilst they grabbed their pills. The group agreed, and Junior and Albus got ready to run. However, just as Albus and Junior sprinted into the clearing, Loam finally turned around after having now murdered Jay. He immediately headed for Albus and the pair engaged in a scrappy sword fight. Meanwhile, Junior ran around and straight to the pill platform, but just as she was looking at the pills and about to grab one, Daisy, from 12, suddenly appeared within Gloss and Larima's sight, charging straight towards Junior with a spear in her hands. Gloss got ready to throw a knife, but Larima grabbed onto his arm before shaking her head in a knowing manner. Albus managed to finally stab Loam and then ran to grab his pill, just as Junior turned round before being impaled by Daisy's spear. Whilst Daisy was trying to get her spear out of Junior's body, Albus quickly grabbed his pill before escaping through the opposite direction of the cornucopia clearing to where Gloss and Larima were still watching. As the timer in the sky went through one minute left of time remaining, Larima reminded Gloss that they needed to start moving, and so they ran into the clearing together. As they ran towards the platform, Gloss quickly threw a knife at Daisy, which hit her in the neck and killed her almost instantly. He and Larima then continued to the platform, where there were four pills left. They each took one, but just as Gloss carried on running through the cornucopia clearing with his pill, he noticed that Larima was swallowing her pill already, 
and then throwing the two remaining pills on the floor, which were now hidden within the grassy patches. When Gloss asked Larima what she was doing, she slyly smiled and replied, making it harder for the rest of them. Gloss later stated how at this point he realised that Larima was so intelligent that she was almost untrustworthy, as she was managing to sabotage other tributes without breaking the rule of only being able to hold one pill at a time. Larima then ran with Gloss out of the clearing and waited as the timer in the sky was now at less than 30 seconds. As they continued watching the platform through the grass, they spied Austin from Six rush to the platform and at first looked confused at the absence of any pills, but then panic as the timer in the sky turned red and beeped loudly as it went under 10 seconds. He started frantically hunting around the floor, but with no success, as the timer hit zero, a loud klaxon roared from the platform and within seconds, Austin stumbled backwards before falling to the ground, completely still, except for his eyes, which were moving in confusion. Gloss and Larima re-entered the clearing, and they could see Austin's eyes locked on them, but then frantically blinking in terror. Larima laughed slightly, but Gloss approached his body and without hesitating, jammed his sword through Austin's head, followed by his cannon sounding. For the rest of that day, Gloss and Larima travelled in the opposite direction to where they thought Albus had gone before sleeping that night. They discussed what their remaining options could be, and agreed to keep travelling in circles that were equidistant to the cornucopia and the perimeter, with Gloss holding Larima on his shoulders for a better view of the rest of the arena. As the next three days went by, this plan worked and they managed to kill three others and live off the supplies that they took from these fallen tributes, whilst also being gifted with new gifts from sponsors. The pair were indeed very pleased on the sixth day to each receive a scythe, which was not only useful for cutting through the grass, but could also make an extremely useful weapon. However, over these few days, Gloss and Larima noticed that the grasshopper's chirping was becoming louder and more frequent, whilst they were also becoming more likely to invade Gloss and Larima's personal space, sometimes even resting on their shoulders as they walked, before chirping in an irritating, high-pitched tone right next to their ears, which caused the pair to lose their temper on several occasions. Indeed, on the sixth night, both Gloss and Larima were woken on several occasions by these grasshoppers, much to their annoyance. They did find that sometimes when they swiped at the grasshoppers with their scythes, it would send them away, but shortly afterwards, another swarm of grasshoppers would land near them and wake them up just as they were starting to fall asleep again. As sunlight flooded through on the morning of the seventh day, Gloss and Larima had both given up on sleeping, due to the constant noise from the grasshoppers. However, whilst they were once again arguing, this time about their lack of food, the game makers announced that a feast would be held in the cornucopia within half an hour, and that they would be offering something that all tributes would desire. The pair stopped arguing, and ran back to the cornucopia as quickly as they could through their ongoing exhaustion. Once they were at the edge of the cornucopia clearing, they carefully peered through the grass, waiting for the feast bags to arise out of the platform. However, when one unnumbered bag suddenly rose up onto the platform, the pair looked at each other with confusion. Gloss was about to ask Larima about it, but then she urged him to immediately grab this mysterious bag while she covered him. Gloss ran into the clearing, but just as he started making his way towards the bag, he spotted Dimitri running parallel to him in the same direction. As they neared the platform, Gloss saw that Dimitri had bags under his bloodshot eyes, and his skin was a deadly pale, which was surprising as the sun within the arena had previously caused Tribute's skin to tan. Gloss jumped sideways as he neared Dimitri and kicked him in the head, which knocked him to the floor. As he then sprinted towards the bag and grabbed it from the platform, he spotted a spear hurtling towards him, which he managed to swiftly dodge, before running back to Larima and fleeing with her from the clearing. They continued running through several swarms of clinging grasshoppers, whilst they heard a cannon boom out, which they presumed belonged to Dimitri. However, once they stopped and rested in a remote clearing, Gloss removed the bottle to find what appeared to just be a perfume bottle. The pair were as confused as each other, but whilst a grasshopper was chirping loudly in Gloss's ear, Larima noticed a note in the bag that told them to apply liquid from the bottle every six hours. Larima took the bottle and applied some to herself, then she almost immediately noticed that the grasshopper on Gloss's shoulder had stopped chirping. She quickly told Gloss to apply some to himself as well, and once he sprayed it on his neck, the grasshopper quickly flew away, whilst another swarm that had been flying towards the pair now flew upwards and away. At this point, the pair realised that, to their relief, they had just acquired some grasshopper repellent. That night, they were able to sleep very comfortably in the middle of a thick patch of grass. 
They only woke up to reapply the perfume and by the time they awoke the next morning, they were clearly feeling much better and more prepared to fight. That day, they also found Michigan from six while she was standing in a path and blankly staring at some of the long grass. Larima got a knife ready, but Gloss stopped her, seemingly intrigued by the strange psychological force that had gripped Michigan. As the pair walked closer behind her, they heard that she seemed to be talking to someone, even though there was clearly nobody there. Larima whispered that she must be hallucinating due to sleep deprivation, and keen to put her out of her misery, Gloss marched up behind her with his scythe, then quickly decapitated her. During the next two days, Gloss and Larima continued hunting for Albus and Excel from three, but without any success. However, on the morning of the tenth day, Gloss woke up to hear something falling to the floor near his head. He looked up to see that Larima had the repellent in one hand and her scythe in the other. Rapidly realising that she was trying to run away with the repellent, Gloss sprang into action and grabbed his scythe whilst Larima lashed out at him. They continued swiping at each other whilst continually diving backwards as well from each other's swipes. However, whilst they were fighting, Gloss secretly took a knife from his back pocket and threw it straight at Larima's brain, which sent her falling backwards before her cannon rang out a minute later. Gloss packed all their joint supplies and travelled through the arena. There were times when he thought that he might have heard Albus or Excel near him, but he would later realise that this was most likely to be the grasshoppers instead. However, during the early morning of the 11th day, another cannon blasted out and the game makers announced that the two remaining tributes needed to return to the cornucopia, and then in five minutes' time, all grasshoppers in the arena would be directed towards their trackers. Gloss quickly grabbed his scythe and throwing knives before sprinting back to the cornucopia. He was there within three minutes, and then just as he was looking around for any sign of either Albus or Excel, he saw a knife from the corner of his eye flying straight at him before it buried itself in his shoulder. Gloss gasped out in pain as Albus trudged into the cornucopia. Over the last four days, Albus had received a total of three hours of sleep, and therefore he now looked extremely bedraggled and exhausted, with grasshopper limbs littered throughout his clothing and nestled into his hair. As he ran in a lopsided manner and then threw a knife, Gloss ducked and then readied his scythe. With no knives remaining, Albus tried to raise his sword as he ran towards Gloss, but Gloss was easily able to dodge Albus's weak attempts, until Albus swiped again and tripped to the floor. As he tried to get up, Gloss trod down on his back before decapitating him with the scythe, thereby becoming this year's victor. After winning, Gloss briefly returned to District 1, but after realising how popular he was within the capital during his visits, he moved to live there permanently just months after victory. Whilst he was there, he lived an extravagant life and allegedly had many mistresses, including Natalia Dovecote, Ariana Cardew, and Tigris Snow. His sister, Kashmir, also went on to win the next year's games, which made them the first pair of siblings to both be victors. However, they were later killed within seconds of each other during the 75th games. So, thank you everyone for listening, and games 64 to 66 will be available in next Monday's video. Now, I'm also going to attach a pinned comment below to this video, and with this comment, I'd like to invite you to ask me any questions that you have. Lots of people have been asking me various questions about this series and other things, and instead of replying to each individual comment, I'd like to give everyone these answers at the end of next week's video. Therefore, please feel free to reply to the comment that I'm attaching below with any questions that you might have for me about the series, about anything else I'm planning in the future, or just about anything else in general. And I will take some of these questions and answer them at the end of next week's video.